from New York City for our viewers worldwide. A very good morning. I'm Manus Cranny in for Jonathan Farrow. So the CPI revisions set up a beautiful table for risk for this Friday. Countdown to the Open kicks in right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Coming up on the show, futures rise, yields off their lows, this after the U.S. CPI revisions. And it's a tale of two earnings. L'Oréal disappoints and Hermès delivers a beat. President Biden's attempt to alleviate memory concerns backfires. But we begin with a big issue. It's the latest inflation data and it barely moving the needle or not. It certainly is a nothing burger, and that is good news. The Fed is focused on PCE inflation, and it's good to know that we don't have lingering concerns about whether the CPI is breaking away from what we've seen in the PCE. And certainly when we look at the PCE deflator, it's slowing. It's above 2% target, but it's headed in the right direction. Let's bring in Mike McKee to discuss uh, these revisions on the CPI. So, Mike, uh, just how... Stoic were the revisions. Yeah. The revisions were very stoic, uh, almost no changes at all. But if you take a look at the chart here, you can see what happened last year. I put it in the red box. They revised the seasonal adjustment factors, and that pushed up inflation at the end of 2022 and disappointed Fed officials who thought they had been making progress because originally it looked like inflation was falling faster. And that put the spotlight on today's revisions of 2023 data. But turns out last year was just a one-off and we didn't see much of a change. December's CPI on a month-over-month -month basis went from a three-tenths rise to a two-tenths rise, did not change the year-over-year -year number, which stayed at 3.3 percent. And so uh, it was a, a non-event that was seen as good news because in this case no news was good news. Next week matters though. We get the CPI, the actual CPI for the month of January and as you can see progress is still expected ahead with all of the numbers going down just a little bit. The question is will there be any surprises in there? The Fed is going to be watching that closely although the key thing about all of this the last two days is that the Fed doesn't watch the CPI to make its decisions. It watches the PCE numbers. Now, some of the PCE numbers are going to be different than what we see in the CPI. The CPI for housing, uh, for example, is about 30 percent of the whole index. And as you can see, the numbers for rent have been going down, which is what the government uses uh, to calculate this indicator, but we're not seeing a move in the CPI. So the Fed is expecting a bigger move than perhaps we have seen lately, and that could have an impact uh, on both the CPI and the PCE. We'll have to see. That'll be Tuesday's big story. Yep, we kick the can along for another piece of data. Mike, thank you very much, Mike McKee. Now, John Hancock's Emily Rowland weighing in on the risk situation. Quote this. The best time to take risk in portfolios is when everything looks bad. Right now, everything is awesome. Optimism is high. The investors should consider managing risk. How do we do that? Let's have that conversation. Emily Rowland and Christina uh, Mamani join me now of Lafayette College. Ladies, good to have you with me. So, Emily, there you go. It, it, it's wonderful days, good CPI revisions. The auctions went well, record after record in markets. How do I manage my risk and my exuberance right now? Good morning. Good morning, Manus. Yeah, it's pretty amazing to see the amount of optimism pervading markets. I'm looking this morning at things like Bitcoin and other crypto related assets surging. That's been reflected in areas like small cap equities. You know, this is the point in the market cycle where investors are celebrating. We have this perfect scenario where economic growth is reaccelerating the labor market has been incredibly resilient in the face of higher interest rates. Um, and you have the soft landing or even the no landing scenario looking ever more likely. We just want to be careful right now. Um, we're seeing investors reaching for risk here. We're seeing, uh, again, a lot of optimism across markets. It doesn't mean we don't want to participate and we're still invested. We're finding opportunities across equities in a risk managed way. We're looking at bonds as having 
the potential to do more heavy lifting in portfolios. We just want to be mindful of the fact that oftentimes in this, these late cycle environments, everything really looks awesome uh, before there becomes a, a challenge, a liquidity event, some type of financial potential accident here. So we want to be mindful of risk in portfolios as we head into the remainder of 2024. I like the phrase, it's a moment in the cycle of celebration, but I think we're so scarred by a number of events. The most recent, obviously, is the pandemic. Um, Krishna, good morning to you. Uh, cycle, we're in, we're in this celebratory moment in the cycle. Yields have actually backed up through the week. 15 basis points on the 10-year paper. The auctions went grand. The CPI was reviewed. On this backup on yields, this must present a good opportunity, I presume, to pick over the bones of these auctions and pick up some duration. Okay, so I, I think the, the the point she was making was extraordinarily good. That is the the environment today is a good environment, and valuations to some extent largely reflect that environment. So the question becomes, how do you risk manage your portfolio, and what is really the risk that you're managing towards? And I would say the risk that you're managing towards is really not growth continuing in a meaning uh, continuing to be really good. What you're managing for is uh, the, the, the likelihood of growth slowing down precipitously. And in that context, I think uh, the bonds, uh, long bonds in, in, at the current levels offer a really good opportunity. Doesn't mean they will do well if the current trend continues. I think they will probably uh, tread water. Mm -hmm. But if the risk of things softening in a meaningful way comes about. Do you think that's a real of, risk, Krishna? Happening? A precipitous slowdown? Because that. I mean, is that a left tail risk as opposed to your base risk? Oh, absolutely. I think the base case is that the things continue the way it is and the market continues to grind higher uh, in, in equities and everything else basically treads water because uh, they are reflecting the current level of play in, in rates and in, in credit. So that is the core view. But I think if you wanted to risk manage your portfolio, what would you do? You certainly wouldn't sell equities here. What you would do is buy long bonds. Okay, long bonds are, are the hedge. Uh, Emily, you, you make this point. I think you put it very nicely. The S&P 500, the growth index, is trading at 26 times forward P. So that's about a 46% premium to the 20-year average. You're going to have a strong stomach for this stuff. Stocks can <laughs> trade expensive if they deliver above market earnings growth. Now, do you believe that we are in late cycle earnings growth? Is it going to be challenged? Are wages going to challenge that? Or is this momentum in earnings growth going to be sustained. Emily. Well, yeah, nothing to worry about here at all. Just a good old fashioned 46 percent premium to its 20 year average. Um, you know, it is. You sound like more, me and that worries me. That, that, that actually worries me. Go on. Nothing to see here. Uh, no, I mean, you know, certainly valuations are becoming egregious, especially when you look at that mega cap tech, the large cap growth indices. But earnings right now are delivering. Um, you look underneath the hood and, and tax producing earnings, um, it's higher quality. These are companies largely with great balance sheets, lots of cash, you know, obviously a limited need to tap the capital markets, uh, low interest burdens. The quality factor is getting rewarded here, not only from a price perspective, but also from an earnings perspective. So we're not downgrading technology stocks because we do think that they can have of the best earnings across the market, but you've got to be careful here as, as they are trading expensive. So we're looking to diversify away from that by also owning areas like U.S. mid cap stocks, which actually are trading at a 30 percent discount to their large cap counterparts. That's the steepest discount that we've seen since the late 1990s. Mid caps are dominated by industrials companies. That's a massive sector overweight. And we think industrials can benefit not only from their earnings continuing to come through. Industrials tend to be dominated by long-lived projects, so their in, their earnings can continue even in late cycle environments to be pretty robust. And they're also benefiting from things like onshoring and continued fiscal spending in the United States that's been targeted at things like EV production and semiconductor plants. So we think there's other opportunities outside of tech to kind of balance out that valuation risk that's there. You can come and have breakfast any day with Danny Berger and myself. She's an evangelist for, for, for small caps, <laughs> more so Russell 2000. But can I just ask you to qualify that? Are you prepared to step in and take risk in mid caps before the rate cutting cycle starts? Or do you need a sustained rate cutting cycle 
to deliver value in the mid caps? Yeah, you don't. And I want to distinguish between small and mid cap equities. We do have a preference for mid caps, not mm -hmm. only because of the onshoring theme and the story around industrials, but if you go underneath the hood at the small cap indices, almost 50% of the Russell 2000 index is comprised of companies that are unprofitable. You're also seeing a lot of, again, crypto related assets creeping up into these small cap indices. So there's a lot of risk inherent there. We would wait to more fully lean into small cap equities until there's more evidence that we're in an early cycle environment. When we see that first kind of resounding bounce higher in economic data coming out of an economic contraction, which we still anticipate here. So I don't think the time is quite right yet for small caps, but we really like mid cap equities in the U.S. as a way to play this reshoring theme. Krish, how do you come down in this, Krishna, in terms of, uh, you know, the big cap to the breadth argument? Well, so I, I think it's fair to say that the, the, the breadth issue has been with us for uh, quite some time, but I think it is also important to kind of uh, reiterate the fact that that hasn't stopped for the, the large cap indices from doing reasonably well. So I, mm -hmm. I think the case for uh, cheapness of small and mid is real. You know, they are definitely better value, but that doesn't mean that for the next six months uh, uh, they can do reasonably well in the current environment or do better than what large caps are going to do in the, in the current environment. Yes, they are cheap, but they can remain cheaper until there's a, 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 there's a kind of a industrial renaissance that Emily is talking mm -hmm. about kind of becomes very apparent, which isn't so, uh, you know, so apparent at the moment. When you hawk over the coals, this is for both of you to, to have a think about. When you hawk over the coals this morning, Hermes manages to sell to the super rich at increased prices. L'Oreal has got challenges in Asia consumer. Expedia, apparently we're not booking as many holidays or certainly not of the same value. So you, you are seeing dips in things like Snap and some of those, mm -hmm. some of those customers. When you look at the news flow this morning, Emily, Let's just deal with that sort of luxury consumer side. It seems as if there's a bifurcation going on there between high-end luxury um, and the rest of the market. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you are starting to see some challenges to the consumer at the lower end of the market. I've been focused a lot this week on looking at things like the delinquency data that we're seeing. Um, we're definitely seeing that perking up, especially for the low-end consumer. Um, you know, we know that loans are really, really challenging right now. Credit card interest rates are 25 to 30 percent right now. Auto loans are double digits. So the consumer is really starting to get squeezed here. And you're seeing it in this bifurcation across earnings. You know, broadly speaking, most uh, the, the labor market, again, is relatively healthy here. Mm -hmm. So you're seeing consumers continuing to spend. But I think there's a challenge to that narrative. And I would just finally bring it back to Broadly, what we're seeing in corporate earnings, which margins are starting to get compressed. You're seeing that higher cost of capital eating in uh, to those margins at the same time that record revenue growth, which was helped a lot by $5 trillion in fiscal stimulus, is starting to normalize. So companies are dealing with that by cost cutting and laying off workers. And those are the companies that are showing strong results here. And they're doing it by cost cutting, not necessarily uh, growing from a top line perspective. So this is a pretty normal for a late cycle environment. And it means you've got to look underneath the hood to identify companies with superior earnings prospects. And that chimes for you, Krishna, doesn't it, in terms of big is beautiful, in terms of balance sheet, in terms of cash flow. I mean, that's where you want to lean into. Uh, yes, very much so. I, I, I think that uh, uh, Emily's thesis will play out at some point in the cycle for sure. But whether that plays out over the ne next six months, uh, I, I think, is the part that I'm kind of raising uh, raising issues with. But uh, the, the uh, at the end of the day, as far as consumption is concerned, it's really employment and income growth that drives it more at the aggregate level anyway, uh, drives it more than anything else. And that still looks very, very, uh, very, very robust. And the other thing about uh, kind of uh, the late cycle thinking is to remember, remember that that late cycle can last for a long period of time. And mm. that's, the, that's the one thing that we have to be very, very cognizant of. It's not inevitable that the late cycle ends in a six-month time frame or 12-month time frame. It can continue like this for a few years based on fiscal spending alone. 
Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. let, let's mm -hmm. let's let's see where we go to next week. We get that <laughs> C, those CPI numbers, uh, which of course won't make or break sentiment, but I think it will certainly add to the narrative uh, about the timing of potential rate cuts from the Fed. Thank you so much for being with me this morning. That's Krishna Mamani and Emily Rowland, my guests. Let's take a look at the stocks that are moving ahead of the opening bell. Katie Greifel is with me. Katie. Let's kick off with NVIDIA because it's adding to its already very impressive rally. Of course, Reuters reporting this morning that NVIDIA and Swedish telecoms firm Ericsson are in talks to co-design a chip that is boosting Ericsson, but also NVIDIA. That's good for a 1.6% rally pre-mark. And then we move on to some earnings stories. Pepsi, it's been wiggling around this morning. It was lower a bit earlier this morning after delivering a disappointing full-year sales forecast. That's in addition to the drop in volumes that they reported. But you can see shares pretty much flat now just a little bit higher and then we have to talk about a firm of course this is a buy now pay later company it's having pretty bad morning it delivered a weak outlook the company's forecast for annual transaction volume came in below expectations and you can see the stock is being punished pre-market currently down by over six percent katie thank you very much a pretty big move there to the downside coming up banker bonuses sharp in focus in the culture, they see the upside momentum. So I think compensation is reflecting all of it, but it's measured. Wall Street watching Barclays today as it plans to ditch dozens of payouts for employees. That conversation next on Bloomberg. pleased with uh, the efforts that uh, our people brought into, into making the integration successful. They are integrating well in the, in, the cult, in, in the culture. They see the upside momentum. So I think compensation is reflecting all of it, but it's measured and, uh, and uh, 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 totally uh, aligned with the UBS standards on how we pay people. Paying for performance, Sergio Monti there, the UBS CEO, speaking to Bloomberg earlier this week. UBS prepares for bonus season. Barclays is planning to give dozens of bankers a great big zero. Bloomberg reported a larger-than-usual group of lowest performers within the investment bank will receive no bonus, complicating the company's effort to rebuild the unit. Tom Metcalf is with us. Great scoop by uh, you and the team. Tom, good to see you this morning. I mean, in some ways, is this that shocking? This is about ensuring that your star performers are retained and that those people that are not delivering to the gravy train are out the door or choose to go out the door. That's the message, isn't it? Yeah, look, this is classic banking. Absolutely, you're right there. But what's the difference here is, you know, and there's lots of phrases for this, getting bagel, getting donutted, getting goose egged. Um, what's unusual about this situation at Barclays is just how many bankers there are going to be going through this. And, you know, it's definitely always been hitting those lowest performers. But here we're hearing, look, it's dozens and dozens. And I think that speaks, you know, in part to the industry. We all know, you know, deal making's tough out there, but also to some specific issues at Barclays. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the people who are running the business, um, Carl Deasy and Taylor Wright, I, I can see the philosophy, which is retain my star rainmakers last year with uh, retention bonuses, with stock, with restricted stock, with whatever it is. But that eats into the pie of what you've got to deliver for the worker bees, not so much worker bees, but let's say transactional bankers. Um, and, and this is the difficulty. How important is the investment bank at Barclays? It's been a perennial issue for Jess Staley. It's been an activist investor issue at Barclays. The, the identity of the investment bank there is a question. Oh, no, absolutely. And these are the questions that have just been going on for years. And current management right now is, is you know, rather trying to find a solution fairly quickly. They've got an investor day February the 20th. And, you know, our intel suggests, look, there's not going to be a drastic change in terms of the investment bank itself, in terms of they don't want to sort of, you know, cut it loose or anything like that. What they do want to do is they recognize shareholders just really do not value capital markets businesses as much as they do the very steady income you might see from a retail bank or the cards payment business that Barclays also has. So our understanding is effectively, and we've seen some insight into that today with a the deal they did for a retail bank in the UK, Tesco Bank, is basically management really focused on growing the other parts of the business um, while maintaining the investment bank as it stands. Um, but as you point out, look, this is huge, difficult strategic choices and those decisions they made to retain top paying bankers last year, no, no doubt essential, but obviously that then has an impact on this year's bonus pool for other bankers. 
It has indeed. Tom, thank you very much. Tom MacArthur uh, on the Barclays bonus scoop at Bloomberg. Let's turn to the retailers now. L'Oreal shares uh, tanked by 6% in North Asia in the fourth quarter, sending the stock down this morning. On the flip side, you've got Hermes shares surging. This is the luxury retailer's fourth quarter revenue jumped 17%. Katie Greifeld is with me. This is about the ability to put through price rises at the very upper end of product. Absolutely, and uh, that's definitely the case for Hermes to get into some of the numbers here. Fourth quarter revenue climbed 17.5% at constant exchange rates. Uh, analysts have been looking for a gain of about 14%, so that's quite a meaningful beat there. And you also heard the executive chairman saying that the company plans product price hikes of 8 to 9% on average in 2024. So if you make Birkin bags, yes, Manis, you do still have pricing power there. Of course, it's quite a different store, story over at L'Oreal. Fourth quarter sales overall, they trailed estimates, but the real headline here is that revenue from North Asia in particular dropped 6.2%. Analysts had been looking for a flat reading overall, so quite a big disappointment there. So the reason why is this really challenging travel retail market. You're seeing Chinese and Korean shoppers in particular rein in their spending. Is that, and as Morgan Stanley put it this morning, quote, the key question here will be how long China remains soft. And you're seeing that really, that question being asked in the shares this morning. Okay, Katie, thank you very much. Uh, very, very different price reaction function there. Coming up on the show, you got your morning calls a little bit later. Invesco's Brian Levitt joins me to weigh in on this equity market rally. The S&P 500 closing in on another record high. That conversation just ahead. Run in the revisions of the CPI coming in for uh, the, third, the, the last quarter and for December. And that gives equity markets a little bit of a bid. You've got Palantir uh, on the up. So that's part of the tech narrative. Nicely above 5,000. That'll do for the psychology uh, on a Friday. It's incredibly important. Morning calls. This is what we've got uh, from Wall Street. First up, Evercore upgrades United Airlines to outperform, expecting a meaningful shift in the company's capital allocation. Bank of America downgrades Expedia to neutral, growing increasingly concerned about the outlook for earnings. And finally, Raymond James downgrades Prudential to market perform, seeing limited upside given the stock's rich valuation. Speaking of which, week five of the gains. Will it endure? Are you full bull? Is there concentration risk? Any flashing red signs like Bank of America sees? Uh, well, we'll put that question to Brian Levitt. He joins me very shortly, weighing in on this rally right here on Bloomberg. the nicey bring your own flag uh, a mexican flag there on show there's only one thing to think about and it's sporting euphoria as yields rise equities still manage to trade higher two year yields at the bottom of your screen are the highest since the middle of december we are above five thousand it is super bowl weekend what is not to love about this friday uh, we're rolling over to the cash market you've got the nasdaq up a quarter of one percent again uh, palantir trading on the upside so this is quite a bullish uh, start to this friday countdown to the open there we go flat on the dollar euro and yields as i say on the 10 years they're trading just up three ticks we move higher by about 15 ticks and still it has not dislocated the equity market rally and that's the important point uh, you are just seeing two and five year yields at the highest level since december uh, the 13th and that was just before the revisions but yields take higher. crude trades up one percent uh, we put on six percent nearly six percent this week there is your two-year yields at the bottom of the screen 448 let's stick with one of the stocks PepsiCo. The company delivering a disappointing outlook amid weakening volumes in North America. Katie Greifield is with me. Katie, 
Manis, yeah, full year sales, that forecast did disappoint, but it was really the drop in volume that's turning heads this morning to get specific volume in North American beverage business. That was down 6%. Quaker Foods North America volume down 8%. And PepsiCo's revenue overall was $27.9 billion in the fourth quarter. That was below the average analyst estimate. And this is really potentially a sign of the times. We're, we're talking about earlier how Hermes still has pricing power. It looks like PepsiCo might have reached its limit. Remember, over the past several years, the company has consistently raised prices to offset those higher input costs that the company was having to deal with. That has helped PepsiCo beat on profit and revenue consistently over the last few quarters. Now it seems like that strategy may be sputtering here. And that's a reality that the company itself acknowledged in this earnings report, the CFO saying that consumers can now expect to see a slowdown in price increases. It's interesting to watch how the market is receiving this news. Shares currently Currently down about two percent. Katie, thank you very much. Let's stick with the earnings track. Pinterest shares under pressure, missing the holiday revenue estimates. Ed Ludlow joins me from San Francisco. So again, another bruising uh, for Pinterest. We saw some snap action earlier in the week. Take it away, Ed. Yeah, I mean we're down more than ten percent at the open. That puts it on track for its biggest drop since April of last year, I think. But it is not as severe as the knee jerk we got in after hours when the numbers hit. Top line growth of 12 percent, $981 million of sales in the quarter gone, but below the expectations of the street. And what's so interesting here is similarly to Snap, they showed some user growth, uh, users reaching 498 million monthly users, which is a record high for them. The concern is their conversion, right, and the strategy behind uh, how they reach an audience on behalf of advertisers. Let's play the game of is Manus or is Manus not on any given social media platform. But like my use of Pinterest has been, for example, around when I plan my wedding with my wife. You bid up storyboards. What Bill Reddy, the CEO, has done is said, how do we take that concept on the platform and convert it into transactions? In other words, direct response ads. Direct response ads, when he took the helm, were about a third of their business. Now it's two thirds. But it's not necessarily uh, materializing as the top line growth that the street expects. One piece of standout news as we continue to be down 9.5% is that they announced a partnership with Google. Um, similar to what they've done in the past with Amazon, the idea being that if you are uh, faced as a consumer with a picture, you have a way to click through resulting in a transaction down the road. And the partnership with Google is substantive because through Google shopping platform and search, it gives Pinterest an audience that's global, not just in North America. Uh, not getting a lot of love, though, down 9.5%. Now, look, Ed, we just have a little bit of breaking news come through. This is uh, through X and bet MGM they're going to sign a sporting partnership um, so this is an interesting sort of side shift for the X brand at uh, bet e e at bet MGM uh, each game linking to bet MGM's website talk me through yes. this what's the rationale here J just think about X as a distribution platform you know, that is how all of the sales and ad executives working at the company are pitching this, right? So it appears in the timeline tied to Super Bowl Sunday, but it can get redirected to that uh, third party, which in this case is BetMGM. It's a traffic provider. There is so much news coming out from X this morning. We're actually going to speak to their head of uh, partnerships uh, in the 10 o'clock hour, so tune in for that, Brett White's. But the other piece of news uh, that Bloomberg's reporting is they're out there right now shopping ad slots for the Super Bowl, ranging from the kind of hundreds of millions to the million, uh, sorry, hundred thousands to millions for small increments. And they have this partnership with WWE. What you're starting to see is X reposition itself from text to different forms of content, but they're doing it through partnerships where there's a kind of ad share um, or revenue split concept with the third parties with which you sign deals. That was a lot, uh, but I hope it makes sense. Yeah, no, 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 it, it does. I mean, it's about, it's, it's about progress and evolution of what is the X platform, and it is obviously a multimedia platform which is engaged in sports. It's, it's huge. Uh, and by the way, they've said that major professional and college sports will follow in weeks to come. So again, it's about building yeah. uh, momentum in terms of the generations. Ed, thank you very much. Deftly handled. Uh, we'll also be watching the shows of a firm. The buy now, pay later company is forecasting less than expected as questions arise about how long consumers' post pandemic spending spree can really last. Isabel Lee is with me. Isabel. Hi, Manus. Shares of Manus are now flat. Actually, 
edging slightly in the green. In pre-market trading, it was down as much as 9% and also just a few seconds ago. But analysts said that conservative, the guidance was conservative because they're not seeing a slowdown in the second quarter. The buy now and pay later firm expects a forecast of gross merchandise volume to be lower than consensus estimates for the year. But the thing is, in the recent quarter, in the second fiscal quarter, they did top estimates. In fact, we have the CEO saying that this is the fastest growth pace in over a year. So there's that. But now shares are kind of flat up about four tenths of one percent. A firm raked in a total revenue of around 591 million, which is above estimates. They also had the revenue less transaction costs rising 68 percent a year earlier. So the firm also increased its funding capacity by around five billion in the last year. So this buy now pay later firms really benefited from the revenge spending that we've seen after the pandemic. Everyone just wanted to buy things because they were cooped up in their apartments for most of the past two years. But we know the consumers are resilient, but the question is how much further can they go? So that remains to be seen, Manus. Indeed. Isabel, thank you very much. Isabel Lee there. Tune into our conversation a little bit later on with the Affirm CEO, Max Levchin. That is at 11.30 a.m. Eastern. How long can the hedonism of the U.S. consumer endure? Turn to travel. Expedia shakes up the leadership with the CEO change, along with missing estimates on gross bookings. Emily Grayfay O oh, joins me now. Emily, what can you tell me? I mean, a shift at the top, but it is about the bottom line numbers that we really want to focus. That's right, Manis. And that shift in leadership, the CEO now going to be Arian Gorin. She'll be succeeding Peter Kern as Expedia CEO. That really came as a surprise to analysts. And I think that's really what is driving this stock down now 17% at the open. The earnings that they reported yesterday really weren't that bad. The fourth quarter revenue beat slightly, and so did the fourth quarter EPS coming in at $1.72 versus $1.69. Fourth quarter gross bookings missed estimates slightly, coming in at $21.67 billion versus estimates of $22 billion. But really, it does seem like the street here is more focused on that leadership change. According to Bloomberg Intelligence, it could signal a really lack of strategic direction here. Over at Jefferies, they cut their price target to uh, 150 from 160, saying that the CEO change and also Expedia's reduced guidance has really lowered uh, Jeffrey's confidence in Expedia's turnaround. We also saw Bank of America cutting to neutral from buy. So not a great morning for this travel company, Manus. No, nope, it could be it could be just another warning shot uh, across the exuberant buys of the equity market. Emily, thank you very much. Invesco's Brian Levitt weighs in on what to expect this year. Get ready. The market is likely to go higher over the next one to two years, if not longer. Peak inflation, peak tightening. Peak interest rates have historically been good for equities over the subsequent years. There's nothing can stop the train for Brian Levitt. Brian, good morning to you. Expedia down 18%, Snap down 30%, advertising under pressure. Uh, I mean, I could look at one half of the glass, but you're looking at the other half of the glass ready, getting ready for a top-up. Why are you so bullish? I think it, it's a... It's a two different environments. So in the short term, you may, you're may you going to see the economy slow, and that's what's weighing on earnings a little bit. That's what we wanted, right? That's what the Federal Reserve was trying to bring forward. So the economy slows a little. You get a little bit more of a concentrated market, and, and maybe the market a little bit more challenged in the near term. But my point is to say, think over the next couple of years. If you look at just about any environment where we've had inflation move up significantly once it's peaked, not when it gets back to 2%, once it's peaked, the next multiple years have historically been good for equities. That's been my North Star. It worked. It has worked very nicely since inflation peaked in June 2022 and continues to be my view. Pretty stoic equity markets. I, I, I caught myself short. Two-year and five-year paper at the highest level since the middle of December. And, you know, this equity market has gone on to evolve even higher. New records, uh, record all-time highs for the S&P 500. Now, can that lockstep prevail with higher yields and higher equity markets? That is not a marriage made in heaven. Well, we're recalibrating a little bit. So you saw a very broad market in November and December um, on the result of investors believing the Fed funds rate was going to 375. And now we're backing that out a bit, yeah. which is why you've seen, for the most part, small and mid caps underperform the mega cap growth names. That's less healthy, as we both know. And so I, I, my point, again, is to say that, that I would expect that you may see some... Uh, 
more of a defensive shift in these markets, a little bit more challenge in the near term. But, but over the intermediate term, rates are going lower as this economy slows and as the Fed eases. And that, that finally gets us out of what's been a bizarre COVID environment and gets us on to, you know, call it a, a mid-cycle slowdown that we emerge out of. I'm just looking at this back up in yields, and I just wonder to what extent do you incrementally pick that up. I've just opened the Bank of America flow show. Flows gravitate to IG and high yield over government bonds. And again, this goes back to the narrative. If we're going into a cutting cycle, why not pick up a little bit of IG and high yield? Is that how you differentiate? Are you more driven to credit than you are to bonds, than you are to sovereign? Yeah, over the next couple of years, credit should outperform again because we should have a mid-cycle slowdown and emerge out of it. And the early stages of that recovery should be very beneficial to corporate bonds. I think that the challenge investors have right now is they love money market. And they love money market because the yields are attractive and the historical volatility is low. Um, and they're not feeling the reinvestment risk to the extent that we thought they may have, because that, to your point, rates are backing up a little bit. My opinion, that's not going to last forever. This Fed will ultimately normalize this yield curve, which yeah. means money market investors have a reinvestment risk. And, and I would say, yeah, lock in yields where you can. Fundamentals in the corporate space look quite attractive. I mean, it would just qualify, uh, you know, I'm just looking down here at the rest of the, the, rest of the lines. High-grade funds recorded another significant inflow last week, the 14th inflow in a row and the largest since June 2020. Uh, are there any flags that talk, I mean, lots of people this week have talked about concentration risk, over-concentration in MAG7. Um, here you go, 14 weeks in a row into high yield. Um, it's, it's pretty... It feels pretty maxed out for risk, but you say no menace, any drawdowns, buy into them. It, it's a strong, it's a strong market, strong world. Embrace it. Yes, that's that's what I feel. There's there's very little excess in the economy. Um, there's not a substantial amount of leverage. Um, business okay. borrowing's actually been moderating on a year over year. So yeah, it's it's the Fed eases and these markets uh, are going to want to go higher. I love what you say. Uh, you know, we escalated quickly. It was a wrong, wrong burgundy moment. Um, but you were disappointed. <laughs> I think it's brilliant. I mean, it's amazing the things I wade through when I get ready to go on a show. It was a wrong, Bur as Ron Burgundy would say, uh, it, it, it felt as if it all sort of went really, really quickly. And you're just disappointed that there's not more breadth. So why not weigh in on the breadth to Mag 7 argument? Have your say, Brian. Yeah, I mean, we're, I would have thought that, I would have hoped that that small and mid-cap rally would have lasted a lot of 2024. You got the whole 2024 outlook before the year even started, and now you have a, a market that's recalibrating where rates are going, ironically, recalibrating rates higher. Ultimately, I think it's an economy that slows. This is what we've been trying yeah. to get, and in a slower economy, you get a bit more concentration. The other side of that is easier policy, a recovery trade, and broader market participation. As I've said a hundred times, I'm a FOMO guy. I don't want to miss out on that. And my expectation is over the next couple of years, a broader market that I want to participate in. Listen, I'm with you 100% on the FOMO. Weaponized FOMO is the line of 2023. <laughs> uh, let's see, it is turning into that 2024. Brian, thank you very much. Brian Levitt uh, on the markets. Coming up on the show, President Biden attempting to alleviate his memory concerns. I'm well-meaning, and I'm an elderly man, and I know what the hell I'm doing. I've been president, and I put this country back on its feet. That conversation ahead on Bloomberg. this country back on its feet. My memory is fine. My memory, take a look at what I've done since I've become president. None of you thought I could pass any of the things I got passed. How'd that happen? You know, I guess I just forgot what was going on. I'm the most qualified person in this country to be president of the United States and finish the job I started. Finishing the job he started, President Biden pushing back, defending himself after the DOJ report labeled him, quote, 
an elderly man with a poor memory. However, during the response, Biden mistakenly confused the Egyptian president with the leader of Mexico. Meanwhile, his lightly rival, presidential rival, that is, Donald Trump, moved one step closer to the GOP nomination after securing a win in Nevada caucuses. Kaylee Lyons is with us. Kaylee, thank you very much uh, for coming in for this. I mean, when you see the presentation, the body language, and even the sound of the president yesterday, he's quite vexed. Yeah, he was incredibly upset with the characterization of his memory in this report. He did say that he was glad that the report found that he did not commit any crime here, noting the differences between the classified documents investigation into Biden and Trump, keeping in mind here that the special counsel, Robert Hur did not actually charge Biden with anything, though did note that he willfully retained uh, classified documents after leaving office. The key distinction that the special counsel made was that in the Trump case, which he said he doesn't necessarily have a, a right to comment on. He was also charged with obstruction. The former President Donald Trump was not just the willful retention of national security information, noting that President Biden and his team cooperated fully with this investigation. He said that that was a key distinction. Donald Trump, though, on the other hand, says that this is just evidence of a two-tiered system of justice and unconstitutional selective prosecution, so it could feed in to that political narrative. And, of course, the other political narrative, perhaps the bigger problem for President Biden this morning, is it feeds into the narrative that there is an issue with his mental acuity and his his age at 81 years old and that he cannot serve a second term in office because of the language in this report things like the special counsel saying he could not remember key years in which he was serving as vice president even the year that his son Bo died which upset the president uh, greatly those kind of uh, lines in the report already have been seized upon by republicans by a republican uh, campaign arms like the RNC as evidence that Biden should not be elected to a second term. And that is something, frankly, that the president can't change. He's 81. There is nothing they can do to to spin that. It, and it, the gaffe like last night saying that the president of Egypt, President Al-Sisi, was the president of Mexico, didn't do much to turn that narrative around. Well, yeah. And, and, and the slightest mistake or misspeak or misstep yes. is, is grabbed upon on, on, on both sides. Um, Kaylee, where are we with Trump? Because he wins the Nevada Republican caucus. So what does this do for the evolution for the ticket? Well, it doesn't much change the narrative we already thought, which is that Trump right now is looking like he will be the Republican nominee uh, come July when the convention is held. In Nevada, it's worth keeping in mind that he did win the caucus. The caucus was the only chance to actually pick up the state's get delegates because of a very confusing system. There was a primary two days ago where Nikki Haley was on the ballot. Trump was not. But she had no opportunity to win delegates because of the Republican Party of Nevada's rules uh, around this contest and also lost to the selection on the ballot none of these candidates. So it was pretty bruising optically for her. Trump will now walk away from Nevada with all of the delegates in hand and we will look ahead to the next con con contest two weeks from tomorrow. Is the South Carolina primary on February 24th in Nikki Haley's home state where she served as governor. She is still lagging behind him significantly in polls in that state. Uh, and so right now it does not look like Nikki Haley has a real opportunity to eat into Trump's lead at this point. But of course, we'll look to Super Tuesday where there are 11 states that also have open or semi-open primaries where she could try to gain some traction. She certainly still has uh, the money behind her. Donations are still pouring into her campaign. But Donald Trump is far and away the front runner is picking up far more delegates as we go along. Well, it certainly looks as if this theater is set to take place in South Carolina, isn't it? It doesn't look like she's stepping back anytime soon. But then, of course, that is what a shock and awe is all about in politics. Kaylee, thank you very much. Kaylee Lyons uh, tracking the political stories from Washington. Uh, for some sector price action, let's get back to Kaylee Greifeld. A quick look here. You take a look at the S&P 500, just slightly higher. You have five sectors in the green right now. Big tech and energy hand in hand pushing this index higher. Big tech leading the way. They're up six tenths of a percent. You do have six sectors in the red right now, and that is led by consumer staples. That group down about eight tenths of a percent. A lot of those losses coming, of course, from Pepsi with that disappointing earnings report dragging that sector down. But overall, we're pretty much an even split, and we are above 5,000, Manis. The magic number. Katie, thank you very much. Coming up, we'll set the events for you to watch. It's counting down to CPI on Tuesday. It's a hazy daisy day in New York, but we are over the 5,000 level. That's important.
nothing can stop this equity market at the moment, even rising bond yields to levels that we haven't seen since last autumn. There's the Russell even coming up, the Nasdaq up a third of 1%. Uh, some tech on Palantir is rising. It's Super Bowl weekend. I know that you wanted me to say that. Let's uh, see what's in your trading diary. We've got Super Bowl in the diary. Uh, well, we've got a bit of Fed speak, first of all. Dallas Fed President, President Laurie, Laurie Logan speaks at 1.30 Eastern. And you got it, Sunday. it is the Kansas City Chiefs versus the San Francisco 49ers in the Super Bowl. Pay to play on the advert slots. And we get the CPI data on Tuesday. Plus Coca-Cola report earnings before the opening. Just tracking Pepsi, will they? Will they disappoint? Thursday retail sales. That was Countdown to the Open. We're back on Monday morning. Good morning from New York.